Welcome to Yoga Therapy, Hope and Possibility for People with Chronic Pain. My name is Shelley Prosco. I'm a physiotherapist and a yoga therapist, and I'm really looking forward to sharing this topic with you in this format. And we'll talk about chronic pain as well as how yoga therapy might be able to help you if you are someone who lives with or suffers from chronic pain, or if you help people who have chronic pain or live with someone who is suffering from chronic pain. You know, pain is the number one reason people seek medical care. And if we look at the prevalence of chronic pain, it is estimated that anywhere between 11% or 52% of the population are living with some sort of chronic pain. Depends where in the, in the world you're looking at and what type of survey. But the Center for Disease Control website tells us, um, they report that the US prevalence is one in four people are living with some sort of chronic pain. And then in Canada, and in some European countries, approximately one in five people. And in fact, worldwide, the Global Burden of Disease study in 2013 showed that the greatest cause of years lived with disability was chronic low back pain. And this was surveyed over um, or almost 300 different conditions and almost 200 different countries. So we know that chronic low back pain causes more disability than any other condition globally. And we know that uh, chronic pain, in particular low back pain, but even just chronic pain in general, can be very costly. Costly for nations, when you look at the healthcare system costs and their economy, but more importantly, your own personal costs. If you're someone who lives with chronic pain or you live with someone in your family that has chronic pain, it can be very costly personally. So not just financially, but in all other areas of your life too, maybe costs your job or your relationships, social status, even your own sense of identity, your mental health, your physical health, emotional health. And so, you know, we look at, at this chronic pain epidemic, if you will, as a public health crisis. And we talk a lot about the opioid crisis which we do have issues with opioid addiction and abuse. But if you look, peel back the layers and really start to look at the root cause and the root underlying cause, we come to the conclusion that, well, maybe it's not really an opioid problem, but it's more of a, a pain problem or a, a public health issue or a public health crisis. So I think that's important to outline. So how do we define pain? Well, we have one definition here from the International Association for the Study of Pain. And they define pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So you see, I bolded the words here that I think are key words. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So you can't have a pain experience without that emotional component. Sometimes the emotional component might be more obvious than others. Like you stub your toe and there's a bit of anger that comes with it. Um, or sometimes you're not as aware of an emotion, um, but it exists. Pain, we do know, is, is both sensory and emotional. And I think as well, it's important to look at the word experience. So pain is not a tangible, measurable, objective thing. It's an output of the brain, we now know. It's real, um, but it's an experience. Uh, one of my mentors, colleagues, teachers, says pain is a lot like love. That's Neil Pearson. And I really like that analogy. I mean, it's not perfect, of course, but love is not something you can objectively measure. It's an experience and it's a holistic experience and it's going to be expressed and um, uh, experienced by everybody differently. And similar, similarly with pain, Pain is also this experience that's unique, and it's a subjective experience. And I think sometimes 
when we start to talk about pain and define it and, and try to explain pain biology, that unfortunately messages come across that aren't accurate. Messages like pain is all in, in your head, you know, or that it's not real or you're making it up. And that's not what we mean at all. Pain is real and pain is an experience and it is an output of your brain. No different than how really everything is an output of our brain. I mean, our vision, our smell, our hearing, our taste, touch, sensations, uh, you know, that, that's all. We have to be conscious in order to experience those things. So, though that word experience, I think, is really, really, really important. And, and then another aspect here that I want to highlight is actual or potential tissue damage. So think of this for a moment. If you bend your finger back and you go nice and slow, you start to feel some stretching, some stronger sensations, and you might go to a point where, ouch, it, it hurts, or you may describe it as pain. And then you let go and, well, there's no tissue damage done. But what had happened there was that your, your alarm system, your pain system, warned you before tissue damage was about to happen. So we do know that the purpose of pain is to protect us and to warn us. Now, if it's something fast or sudden that happens, obviously though, there'll be some actual damage and it didn't have time to warn, warn us. That buffer zone will be smaller. But if, if things are slow and we have some time, the system, a healthy pain system will warn us. And the purpose, the only purpose of pain is, is to protect us. Pain does not tell us specifically what the problem is. It doesn't tell you specifically where the problem is or how bad the problem is or how much the tissue has been damaged or not. There can be some association and some relationship to that, obviously. Um, if you stub your toe or have a paper cut, get your tooth pulled, you have a good idea of why you're experiencing pain. But pain in and of itself, that experience that you're having, doesn't specifically tell you exactly what the diagnosis is, you know, where it is or how bad it is. We have some research that shows paper cuts hurt more at work than they do at home. Um, we also, uh, we all have had that experience, or most of us have had that experience, where you notice bruises on your body, or maybe a bruise somewhere, and you have no idea or recollection where that came from. You don't remember bumping, or you don't remember any kind of pain associated with that. And there's other cases where, um, th think of example, brain freeze, you know, when you have something really, really cold, and you drink it, and it hits the roof of the mouth, and it's severe, sharp, shooting pain literally into the brain, it feels like it. And of course, we know there's no, there's no brain damage or any tissue damage that's going on. So those are just a few examples. And of course, if you want to learn more about pain and the biology of pain, um, I've got some resources at the end for you. So then we ask, well, what is chronic pain? And you see I use another word here, persistent. And we like to use those words interchangeably. They mean the same thing, chronic or persistent pain. Some people prefer the word persistent because it seems a little more hopeful. It seems to reflect really what's going on, which is that pain is persisting. It's a little more descriptive versus chronic pain for some people can sound very dark and doomsday-like and like there's no hope. It's chronic and that's it. This is the end of the road. And we know uh, that that's not true. We have a lot of uh, research and experience that tells us that pain can change and we're going to talk about that. So chronic pain or persistent pain, the IASP says that it is pain that lasts longer than three months or beyond normal and expected tissue healing time. So don't hold on too tight to the three months uh, mark. Uh, let's say you have an injury, you have some acute pain and it's persisting and it's four months in. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to label uh, it right away as chronic pain, but this just gives us a guide. 
See, our tissues, whether it's soft tissue or bones, um, all of the tissues in our body, there is a, a normal or expected healing time for our tissues. And each tissue is different and depending on the type of damage. Um, but we have protocols for that and some idea of what's normal or expected. So of course, everyone's going to be different. Every individual is different. Um, but, you know, um, in generally speaking, if the pain does persist longer than the three months or longer than you know, what might be normal hit a tissue healing time for that particular tissue, you know, then we might start to question and, and think this might be a change in the whole pain system, that alarm system. So it's not just that acute pain in, anymore, something more is going on. And the IASP has just recently come out with these detailed specific classifications of pain. So if you're interested, you can look them up. Uh, these are these were developed in um, 2019. So if you're listening to this well beyond, this might already be revised and outdated. So have a look on IASP's website if you're interested. But basically chronic primary pain can be just really a chronic pain as a condition in and of itself. And that might be something like complex regional pain syndrome or uh, fibromyalgia or nonspecific chronic low back pain or chronic pelvic pain. So these are chronic pain or persistent pain conditions in and of themselves. Chronic secondary pain can be pain that is associated with other conditions. So things like pain that's associated with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, maybe endometriosis or interstitial cystitis, and maybe even cancer-related chronic pain, um, post-traumatic or post-surgical pain, and chronic secondary musculoskeletal conditions, and as well as pain that's associated with some neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis. And I think it's also important to point out here that there are many other symptoms that can accompany persistent pain that may contribute to your overall pain experience. So things like fatigue or sleeplessness, you might start to move or breathe differently. So sometimes what happens when pain persists is that our breath can change. Maybe we hold it or it's a little more shallow and maybe initially early on, if we did have acute pain that turned into this chronic pain, um, initially maybe that short shallow breath helped you because you know, it was meant to protect you. Um, but now perhaps it's, it's not really necessary, but your body has learned that response or, and it, um, the brain wants to produce that output because you know, um, it's a complex process, but the whole system thinks that it's under threat. So then the output would be, hey, we better keep this breath um, shallow or we better hold it to protect. And we may not need to anymore in the case of persistent pain. Uh, we may move differently. And that means we may be bracing or we may have guarded movement. And I see that a lot in my work as a physiotherapist and yoga therapist working with people that have especially chronic neck pain or back pain, um, there tends to be a lot of guarding or, or bracing, moving sort of in this block. And again, that's, it's, it's almost a, a reactive response because the whole system wants to protect itself. It's on high alert. Sometimes we use that language. Other symptoms that might accompany persistent pain, uh, we might have psychosocial or emotional issues that might arise. So we may have anxiety or depression. Um, we might be very fearful of certain activity or different movements or functions. We may have feelings of social isolation, a lack of a sense of belonging. And a lot of people with persistent pain do report feelings of loneliness or hopelessness, helplessness, and cognitive changes can happen as well, like our memory can be affected, it can be reduced, learning ability can be um, affected negatively, 
We may have altered thought patterns. So there's something called pain rumination or catastrophization. So we might be really uh, ruminating or thinking, maybe over-identifying with the pain or overthinking it, over-analyzing it. Um, it's a coping strategy, however, so it's not to put you or anyone to blame. These are normal things that happen when pain persists, but I think it's important for us to, to know these things. Our spiritual health might change as well. And when I say spiritual, in when we talk in in yoga therapy about spirituality, it's a very important layer of our existence. We don't see it as religion, um, but we see it as maybe something more like a your connection to yourself, your true self. Maybe a connection to something greater, if that's what you believe. But it can, we can also look at spirituality as meaning or purpose. And a lot of times when pain persists, we lose meaning in our life. We lose that purpose because a lot of the things that we enjoy or that we used to do, or maybe even our work, um, our, our duties are taken away from us uh, because of the pain. So our whole uh, being is affected here, as I hope you can appreciate. So then this brings us to another definition of pain. And this is a revised definition. The IASP has not yet adopted it, but it was a proposal. And it was, you can look at the paper. I have it underneath there by Amanda Williams and uh, Craig's work. And here's, what, uh, here's how they define pain. A distressing experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage with sensory, emotional, cognitive, and social components. So they add those uh, cognitive and social pieces, which I think is very important, but they still have the actual or potential tissue damage in there. And um, instead of just saying the sensory and emotional experience, they now say it's a distressing experience. So at this time when you're watching this, maybe you can look on the IASP website and see if they have a, uh, a revised definition. So now we ask, well, what causes chronic pain or persistent pain? And the very short answer to this is we don't exactly know. We have some understanding and we have more understanding now than we did years ago and we're learning more and more, but there's still lots of unanswered questions. We do know that there is no one single cause and that it is individual for each person. We know that the process is complex that it's multifactorial, so many different factors um, come into play here. There are many contributing factors to not just persistent pain, but even acute pain and the pain experience in and of itself. We think that chronic pain or persistent pain does have something to do, though, with the pain system, that warning system, that alarm system, not working in the most optimal or healthy way. So if I can give you an example, um, that might help a little bit. So let's just take uh, acute pain for a moment. So for example, let's say you're in a car accident and you sustain whiplash. Whiplash associated disorder is something that um, many of us maybe have experienced or heard of. So you get your head gets a pretty substantial, substantial jolt and you feel pain immediately and several days after. So uh, this is just a really brief example of, of what goes on. But again, to really understand this, I encourage you to look at some of the resources that I have at the end of this that explains pain biology in more depth. But just briefly, so you are in the accident and your head gets a jolt. And so now there is a stimulus to the tissues. So let's say the muscles are put on a stretch or a load. Um, maybe there's a bone, a vertebra that's fractured. So there's some kind of stressor or what we call a noxious stimulus. These receptors, now there's, not, there's no such thing as pain receptors or pain signals. There's just these receptors called nociceptors, but they receive this information from the let's say the damaged bone or the tissue. And that sends a signal to the spinal cord. And then the spinal cord, within the spinal cord, before it moves on, the message moves on to the next um, spinal nerve that then goes up to the brain, 
um, before that happens within the spinal cord there where one nerve talks to the next nerve, there's a whole bunch of processing that goes on to decide whether or not that signal, that danger signal, continues up to the brain. So let's say in this case it does because you, you know, you've fractured the bone and um, you know, the tissue has been, let's say some of the muscles have been strained. That noxious stimulus goes to the spinal cord. There's, there's processing there. There's lots of stuff that goes on there I'm not going to get into, and I, we don't understand it all, and I certainly don't understand it all. Um, but things happen. Let's say it, it allows the message to go up further, and then it reaches the brain. Now, the brain has to make a sensible story out of everything that it's just received, and it includes information from... All some different areas of the brain. So it'll take into consideration your present mood, your thoughts, your beliefs, the state of your immune system, your hormonal system. Um, and, and then what, what happens is that the brain has to then make a, this sensible story. And then the output of the brain is where your pain experience lies. Now, the output of the brain can be a whole bunch of different things, but the purpose of that output of the brain is to protect. So the output could be the sensory and emotional distressing experience. Um, it could be that sensation of what we call as pain. It could be anxiety or fear. It could be uh, the breath might change. Might, you might hold it or it might get sh uh, short or shallow. There might be some bracing. There could be some muscle spasm. The way we move might be different. Um, some muscles might give up, give out, rather, to prevent us from moving any further. Um, so there's a whole host of, uh, of protective responses. So it's complex. Even acute pain is complex, even though it might seem direct, like if you stub your toe or have a paper cut. Yes, that's a little more linear, Paper cut equals pain, stub your toe equals pain, but the process still has to go through this processing, and then the output is the pain experience. So now when we go to chronic pain, so why does pain persist beyond the normal healing time frame? So now let's say with this whiplash injury, the tissues have healed, it's you know six to eight weeks when things are healing in there, um, now it's... Uh, two months, three months, and the pain is not getting better. In fact, maybe it's even worsening. Maybe it's spreading. And so what we think happens here is basically a whole host of different things. But, and again, there's many different mechanisms that might be at play, but it could be a lot of different things in our different systems. And in general, it's basically the whole system, the pain system, and all its complexities, deciding that there still is a threat, deciding that there still is danger, deciding that there is still need to protect you. So it might be that there are many drivers or inputs into the system, um, and there, some may be more dominant than others. So maybe there is some irritation at the tissue, so we don't ignore the tissue or the structure. I think that's important to point out as well. Um, but it, it just is one aspect of the entire pain experience. Other inputs into the pain system that might perpetuate this message that there's a threat and you need to be protected could be things like how you breathe, how you move. So if you're breathing short, shallow, rapid, that might feed more into that sympathetic nervous system state, which is that fear, fright, flight state which may give your body the message. It might be another input. So every output is another input back into the system. So it might give your body the message that you need to protect. How you move, so if you are guarding and um, tend to be holding or bracing, that can again feed into the system as an input. Also the state of your hormonal system and the state of your immune system and even your thoughts and your emotions can be inputs into the system. So if there's certain stress or stressors in your life and it, it makes you feel anxious or fearful, um, 
if there's people that you're around that make you feel you know some negative emotions maybe some anger or places you go if you look at one of the resources at the end um, david butler and Lorimer mosley they talk about the dims and the sims so the danger in me and the safety in me so looking at all the things in your life that offer um, that, that those danger messages to perpetuate and that might be playing a role um, in in the pain experience so there are a variety of different inputs and that leads us very nicely to how yoga might be able to help us with chronic pain or persistent pain so when you look at all these different practices that yoga can offer us we don't actually know exactly the underlying mechanisms there are multiple mechanisms at play here but if you look at what the evidence says just with regards to each one of these individually so movement we know that movement can help people in pain movement has an analgesic effect um, movement in different positions can help change your um, emotions maybe it gives you more confidence and movement and the value of exercise for people in pain has been known for a long time uh, breath in and of itself different breathing exercises might help people in pain maybe it has something to do with the vagus nerve or the parasympathetic nervous system so calming the nervous system reducing threat to the system it might even have something to do with the central nervous system and the brain and those mechanisms and the breath might even influence the immune system which might influence pain so there's a again there's a lot of different mechanisms here um, we also know that awareness practices by themselves can influence pain as well as meditation and mindfulness we have a large body of research that shows different meditation practices can influence pain including self-regulation practices of the breath the body the thoughts and the emotions so then when we look at these as at yoga and we put all these practices together so we can have mindfulness and meditation with movement or in addition to movement and breathing and awareness and and all of these are what we call limbs of yoga and so this again we don't know exactly why yoga works when it does but this gives us uh, some insight into why it might and some understanding but remember it's not just the practices of yoga so we have yoga philosophy as well um, different philosophy can inform the language that we use both as a therapist and both as the per and the person in pain as well um, and how you're speaking to yourself we have yoga philosophy that can really inform that type of language and also help us decide which practices to choose and so yoga philosophy when we look at it in respect to helping people with pain it might be able to help us cope better give us better management strategies it might help us change and reduce the pain or it might actually just help us change our relationship to the pain and reframe pain it can influence a sense of safety a sense of autonomy self-efficacy maybe even just trusting in our body and the processes um, philosophy can inform our thoughts and our feelings about movement and that might influence our pain and as well uh, self-compassion so yoga in and of itself is a compassionate practice and we have some evidence that suggests that increasing self-compassion in the person in pain might be beneficial for for um, managing and reducing pain and then also yoga philosophy provides us provides us with a sense of meaning and purpose and connection so that we're whole and complete and that might help us as well in coping with pain and yoga can also help people in pain by helping to address the public health crisis we know that chronic pain is a complex phenomenon it involves all aspects of our existence it affects us emotionally mentally physically functionally socially energetically spiritually and so people who live with it and suffer from it need to be guided need to be helped in a way that supports this holistic approach and yoga can fit into that yoga is relatively accessible it can be empowering for you um, it can be relatively low risk low cost so we don't have a lot of um, 
you know, high cost procedures or invasive interventions. And yoga therapy can be part of an interprofessional team. So we need healthcare providers, we need rehab professionals and pain specialists and psychologists as part of a comprehensive pain management team. And yoga therapy can be part of that team as well. And here's what some of the research says. So I'm not going to go into detail about the research, um, but I do want to just highlight some of the research that we have on yoga and chronic pain, and specifically the systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So these are the, the, the studies out there that are of uh, higher power. So when we look at chronic low back pain, I have a couple there that are fully referenced at the end of this presentation. Um, we see that yoga and chronic low back pain, that yoga does seem to be a viable pain management strategy. And it also improves mood and stress management, relaxation and self-efficacy for pain-related self-care. And in some of the studies on this systematic review meta-analysis, it report uh, some people reported reduced or eliminated need for pain medication. Breathing pack practices are used as a coping strategy for pain and stress and sleep. Um, yoga is definitely not seen as a permanent cure, but as a long-term strategy for pain management. So overall, we see yoga for chronic low back pain suggests that we do have strong evidence for a moderate benefit indicating that yoga can reduce pain and disability and can be safe and acceptable. And then when we look at rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, chronic low back pain, and fibromyalgia more together, um, there's a couple systematic reviews and meta-analysis there you can look into, but basically saying that yoga is safe and acceptable with some potential benefits for pain and function in these um, conditions that we see here. And then the last three I have is chronic neck pain, um, fibromyalgia, and chronic pain. So again, you can look these up, but the chronic neck pain was a meta-analysis and showed that there were short-term clinically meaningful effects for pain intensity when comparing yoga with usual care. And for fibromyalgia, it seems that only yoga was associated with significant changes in pain and fatigue and depression and quality of life. And that was when it was compared to some other mind-body practices. And then the final, um, the final meta-analysis, yoga for people with pain, it showed that all the studies in here reported a positive effect in favor of yoga with a moderate overall effect. So just kind of lumping a lot of that together, we have limited evidence for which practices specifically are most effective. So we don't really know the details on that yet. And we don't know the underlying mechanisms, but what we do know is that there, there does seem to be improvements in pain, disability, mood, and quality of life. Those are the main measurements. And it does appear safe. So that's a good thing. So we know that we can confidently say that yoga doesn't increase, does not increase pain. And so we can encourage uh, people to practice yoga as long as it is delivered appropriately. And this is where um, you know, we do recommend having a, an individual assessment and someone who is, is trained in delivering yoga uh, safely and effectively for people with chronic pain. And this last slide here on the research is from Stephanie Muna. So she has a really nice, thorough, overall overview uh, summary of the research on yoga and chronic pain in her book chapter, Current Research in Yoga and Pain. And that's in our book, Yoga and Science and Pain Care, Treating the Person in Pain. So check that out if you're interested in the research. So here are five things you need to know if you have chronic pain. Number one, pain is not an accurate indication of tissue damage or what's happening in the body. Remember, the purpose of pain is to protect. It's not telling us where the problem is, how bad it is, or what the problem is. And this isn't me saying this. This is what the research is telling us. The second thing I think you should know is that you have the capacity to change your pain. 
and that provides you with some hope. The third is that you can use any aspect of your existence to change pain. So there's possibility there. So you can use your breath, your body through movement, your thoughts, meditation, changing maybe some of the thinking. Um, you can use awareness practices. And, and that's just in a yoga, from a yoga perspective. So there's just so many different layers um, or aspects of your existence and you can use those as opportunities or options to change your pain. And finally, or number four rather, pain is complex. So often there is no one single solution. So it might not be helpful to think that if only there was that one magic bullet or pill or procedure. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that we, we don't have those medications or those procedures. Um, but what we're trying to really emphasize here is that usually it's not just one thing when we're dealing with persistent pain. There's a whole bunch. So layer options and practices and different rituals. And then finally, number five, create a sense of safety. So when you look at, as I mentioned, the work of Butler and Mosley with their danger in me versus safety in me, uh, Neil Pearson's work with Pain Care U, and um, some of his work with the Pain Care Yoga programs, it's really all based around what we know from contemporary pain science, which is that we need to create a sense of safety within us and around us. And even some of uh, Stephen Porges work with polyvagal theory is in line with that as well, talking about safety. So there is hope and there is possibility and yoga therapy can be part of that if you get uh, the right guidance. And so here are some recommended resources for you. There are some books. Of course, the one that I have first on the list is the one that I was involved in co-editing and co-authoring. We have phenomenal contributors, and it's Yoga and Science and Pain Care, Treating the Person in Pain. There's another phenomenal book by Matthew Taylor, Yoga Therapy as a Creative Response to Pain. And then, of course, the Butler and Mosley book, Explain Pain. Websites and courses, so Pain Care U, I highly recommend uh, having a look on there. There's a lot of different resources. Uh, my website, of course, physioyoga.ca, and Tame the Beast. Have a look at that website. There's a nice short video explaining pain that you might enjoy. And then online video uh, yoga practices. So Neil Pearson and I have Overcome Pain Gentle Yoga Practices. You can download them on Vimeo, as well as the Creating Pelvic Floor Health Practices, which are really nice for people suffering with chronic pelvic pain. Um, those are my practices that can be downloaded from Vimeo as well. And then some podcasts you might be interested in. Neil Pearson has some phenomenal podcasts. So there's the link there to the Yoga and Pain podcast that he's been on. I've been on a few. I have the link there. And the Healing Pain pod podcast with Joe Tata is, has a lot of great resources and guest speakers as well on there. And then there's a list of some educational blogs on pain you might want to look at. Pain Chats is excellent. Again, Pain Care You has got some great blogs. My Cup of Joe is an advocate, a person in pain who has a wonderful blog. And uh, Health Skills is another one as well as Body and Mind. And these are the studies that I was talking about uh, for the yoga and chronic pain research. And again, looking at um, Stephanie Munaz's chapter gives you an overview. Thank you for making it this far. Thank you for your time that you spent on this. I hope it was inspiring. I hope you learned some things. And I really hope that you came away with a sense of hope and possibility because that was my intent to show you that there is hope and there are possibilities. I've worked with people with persistent pain for over 20 years, and you can change your pain. There are options to live with more ease and with a better quality of life and change your pain. So if you want to learn more um, about my work, 
feel free to contact me. I've left you with some uh, contacts there and links. So I'm on YouTube. You can find some of my practices there for free. My Facebook page, uh, Twitter and Instagram handles are there as well. And of course, my website, you can find a lot of resources on there and you can contact me through my website. So I'm going to take you through a couple practices. Um, I hope you enjoy and look forward to hearing from you. Feel free to join me now as I guide you through this awareness practice. So awareness is the first step to change. Whether you want to change a behavior or change your pain, we first need to be aware. And in yoga, we have what we call the five koshas or the layers of our existence. So we look at our physical body or our physical layer, the emotional, the intellectual, the spiritual, and the energetic. And so the practice I'm going to guide you through is just an awareness practice of scanning all of these koshas. And some of the language and the techniques I'm going to use come from Pain Care You. So find a comfortable position and don't do this while you're driving. So if you're listening to this as you're driving, just save this for later. Um, but find a comfortable position. Now you could stay sit, um, sitting up or you could lie down. A comfortable position on your back or on your stomach. Whatever works for you. Just make sure you feel supported and safe and relatively relaxed as best as you can. And you can either keep your eyes open or you can close your eyes. Sometimes people find it a little more... Um, easy to focus and with their eyes closed because they don't have the distractions um, but some people don't like to have the eyes closed so if you prefer to open them that's fine too and first I just want you to become aware of the general state of your thoughts so not going off onto an elaborative story or analyzing too much here, just the overall general state of some of the statements and thoughts going on in your head and just see if you can observe them. Practicing being the watcher. And then noticing your overall general state of your mood or your emotions. And again, just watching if there's any thoughts or stories that are starting to play out. And if so, just gently come back. You don't have to take this too seriously. Just smile at the wandering and come back to just noticing your overall general state of your mood or your thoughts. And then become aware of your overall general ener energetic state. Do you feel a buzz of the body from head to toe knowing that you're alive? Is the energy high or low? What other descriptors might you use for your current energy? No judgments, just noticing without trying to change. And then bring your awareness to your breath. And just notice it as it's entering and exiting the nostrils. Perhaps you're breathing more through one side of the nostril or the other. Notice the rate of the breath, the pace, the depth, the length of the inhale compared to the length of the exhale. Maybe you even notice the sound of the breath as it enters and exits the nostrils.
Notice the temperature of the breath as it enters. Perhaps the air feels a little cooler and drier. As it exits, maybe it feels a little warmer and moistened. Notice any qualities like the texture of it. Does it feel rigid or smooth or bumpy? And notice if there's a gap or a space between the inhale and exhale, or if it's one continuous motion. And there's no right or wrong. Don't try to change anything. You're just noticing and observing right now. Notice how the breath is moving in your body. Maybe the obvious areas maybe in the belly or ribs or chest. But notice if there's some sort of a rhythm in the body, if one part of the body is moving more than another. And then let's change our awareness and slowly bring your awareness to your right hand. Can you feel the palm of the hand, the back of the hand? Can you feel the right thumb, index, middle, ring, and pinky? And then just feel the whole right arm the weight of it, any sensations that may arise, watching the stories, if there are stories that are running on in the mind, just smile at them, thank them, celebrate the fact that you've noticed your mind has wandered. That's a good thing that you noticed. And then just come back to the right arm, noticing the whole arm and anything that comes up, any sensations. and then shifting your awareness over to the left hand. So feel the palm of it, feel the back of it, and then see if you can feel the left thumb, index, middle, ring, pinky. And notice the whole left arm, the weight of it or any sensations without stories or judgment. And then let's shift down now to the feet. So we'll go down to the right foot and take your time bringing your mind's eye there. Notice the sole of the foot, the top of the right foot. And then see if you can feel your right big toe. And then the second toe, the third, the fourth, the pinky. And then can you feel the ankle, the inside of the ankle, the outside? And then your whole right leg. Feel the calf, the shin, the angle that the knee is in, the top of the thigh, the back of the thigh, and your right hip, the outside, the front, the back, the inside. And just feel anything that comes up, any sensations, as long as you feel safe and if you need to shift or move or change your awareness. Of course, do what you need to do to make sure that you are feeling safe and that you're okay with this entire practice. And then when you're ready, let's shift down now to the left foot. 
So take your time, but when you're ready, feel the sole of the left foot and then the top of it. And then let's see if you can feel your left big toe. And then the second one, the third, the fourth, and the pinky. Feeling the inside of the ankle and the outside of the ankle. And then all the way up that left leg, scanning it, just noticing the sensations, the weight of it, where it's touching the surface beneath you, where there's space. Noticing the calf, the shin, the knee, the thigh, the top of the thigh and the back of the thigh, and then that entire hip on the left. And then bring your awareness to the pelvis. So that whole pelvic girdle, the sit bones, the tailbone, the pubic bone where the top of the pelvis sits more at the waist. Just imagining that pelvic girdle and where it's sitting in the body. And then feeling the abdomen in the front and the sacrum in the back, the back part of the pelvis. And then feeling into the low back and then all the way up, take your time just feeling whatever sensations arise as you go up the spine. Just seeing if you can track that awareness from that low back all the way up to the back of the head. So you feel the lower back and the middle of the back and in between the shoulder blades and then up to the back of the neck. Again, just noticing, no judgments. And then bringing your awareness to the front body. So from the belly all the way up, the ribs, the breastbone, the collarbones, the throat. And again, just noticing any sensations or if the right side feels different than the left or the belly, the bottom part of the trunk feels different than the top part of the trunk. And then feeling the face, feeling the muscles around the eyes. Maybe you can get a sense of where your nose is in the very tip of the nose. Feel your cheeks, the tip of the chin, your lips. Maybe you feel the space between the upper and bottom lip. And then notice the space inside the mouth around the tongue. And then see if you can get a sense of where your you is located, whatever that means to you that sense of who you are. Maybe you call it spirit or light or God or divinity or truth, or maybe it for you, it's just your you. That same place inside you, doesn't matter how old you are, you just know it's like that inner space. And see if you can locate it. Is there a space within you that feels like it's you, or maybe it's outside and around you. But just get a sense of what it might feel like to connect with that space. And you can take a few, maybe, longer breaths or do what you need to do open the eyes if they were closed wiggle around and that was your awareness practice or your kosha scan of all the different layers of your being the next practice 
that I would like to take you through is a very gentle movement practice of your choice. And I'm going to use the pain care yoga recovery of movement guidelines and principles. So you're going to find a movement that you know is safe for you, that you know there's no damage going on, but that does challenge you a little bit so that you're, you know you feel that edge of the pain. And then knowing that you feel safe, knowing that you're not going to pay for it later, you keep your breath calm, your body tension as low as you can, and you monitor your pain, and also monitoring the thoughts and the emotions that go along with that. So that's the basis of the recovery uh, movement guidelines through pain care yoga. So find a movement that is quite simple for you and that you know you're not going to get hurt, you know it's safe to do, but you're just reaching the pain. So for example, when I turn my head to the right, I feel a little bit of discomfort and pain in there, but I know for me there's no damage or I'm not going to pay for it later. So I'm going to choose that movement. Maybe for you it's lifting your arm just to here or even lower. Maybe it's, you know, your hip just lifting it up just to the, at the point where maybe it starts to hurt or right before. So choose one. And if you don't have a movement or you're a little scared even um, to do that without any proper guidance, then even just choose a movement that maybe doesn't hurt and just practice these um, with me. So finding your center and finding your breath. And just pay attention to the breath and see if you can make it a little bit longer and a little bit smoother and a little bit softer. Again, something we do in Pain Care You. So it doesn't have to be deep, but just let it linger, let it last, keep it nice and smooth and soft. And then go ahead into your gentle movement of choice that you know you can do. And then come back off it. And try that again. Make sure you feel safe. Make sure you don't think you're like you're going to pay for it later. So you feel safe and you feel good about it. Now see if you can do that and keep the breath calm. So keep that long, smooth, soft breath. And keep the body tension low. So if you notice you get to the end and you start to clench up or guard, see if you can notice that. Are you aware of that? And can you relax? Relax the jaw, the face. So breath calm, body tension low. And of course, monitor the pain. That's the third guideline. So if the volume is turning up, if the pain is getting worse, that's your body signaling you to, to back off. It's trying to warn you. So listen to that, respect it. So you want to pay attention to the pain. You want to monitor it, but you don't want to ruminate on it and pay too much attention. So there's that moderation there. So pay attention to it, don't ignore it, but don't have to necessarily ruminate on it. Keeping your breath calm, your body tension low, and then monitor any thoughts or emotions that come up when you get to that end range. And definitely stop um, if you're feeling it's starting to increase a little bit here. I've done quite a few reps. But that is a really brief example of using these guidelines when you're trying to move in the face of pain, keeping your breath calm, keeping the body tension low, monitoring your pain and checking out those thoughts and the emotions and trying to keep them all sort of calm as well. All, like I said, making sure that you are doing this in a movement that you feel like you're going to be safe in and not pay for it later. So thank you. Um, for joining me and again I hope you feel inspired and you feel empowered and you've learned a few things 
please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if you need more guidance on how to now further learn and check out Yoga Mate for the wonderful instructors um, and yoga therapists for, to help you out.